So while we're pottering away in Geelong looking at NAC in depression, bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, there's another group of researchers in the other end of the universe in South Carolina who are interested in NAC in addiction. And then the reason why they're interested in NAC in addiction is because of this. In addiction, you have a situation where glial glutamate uptake is by this transporter called glial glutamate transporter 1. And drug abuse downregulates this transporter. As a consequence, there's more glutamate in the synaptic cleft. It overstimulates meta, uh, meta, metabotropic glutamate receptor type 5 and NMDA receptors. It increases AMPA signaling and it potentiates synaptic activity. So it's excitotoxic and you have increased neuronal excitation, which occurs in this drug addicted state. Um, and NSL-cysteine normalizes this. So this is the theory behind why NAC might work for addiction. Let me show you some data. Sorry, Michael, so NAC is pretty good at crossing into the brain? Yeah, absolutely. So we've done rat studies, and um, I've got some Im we've got some imaging data that shows that it does it too, but I, I don't, don't think I've, sh I've got those slides in this deck. But absolutely, it does cross the blood-brain barrier, and it does... Alt it, it increases glutathione in the brain and it alters some uh, spectroscopy markers in humans like N aspartate. Which drugs are we talking about when you say drug addiction? <coughs> Sorry, the question is what drugs uh, are, are you talking about? So, well, the answer is it's pretty generic and non specific across addictions. So, um, this seems to be true of cannabis, it seems to be of cocaine. Much of the work has actually been done in co cocaine. And there's also some evidence in smoking, which I'll show you. Nobody's ever looked at, at ice, but we're planning to. So Rebecca McKeaton um, is uh, leading a study to look at n in ice. So this, the name of the study is the NICE study, NAC ice. <laughs> You've got to have a brand, you know, no brand, no study. Uh, so this is a study that we've put into NHMRC for funding. And so it's up to the grant gods and we hope that, it, that we'll get some funding to do the study because we, we agree that ISIS, at least in Australia, it's a major clinical problem. So the methodologically the best study of NAC in addiction so far is this one of NAC in cannabis dependent adolescents. So you've got <coughs> two endpoints percentage of negative urine cannabis, and here you can see much higher percentage of negative urine cannabis in NAC than placebo-treated individuals. And if you look at a survival curve, which is time to uh, relapse, you can see uh, the NAC is doing much better than the placebo-treated individuals. So this is the methodologically the best study so far, suggesting that NAC has a, a role in addiction. Um, uh, there's also, as I said, some data in cocaine, but the data is not fabulous. Um, there's also data in autism. So there's a group of researchers. This is a guy called Antonio Hardan from Stanford. He did a study of n cysteine in autism. They used a, sub, a scale called the Aberrant Behavior Checklist, or the ABC. Uh, and it's got a number of subscales, but the only one that was positive was irritability. This wasn't a big study. If I recall, there's about 45 kids in the study. And as I said, it wasn't a positive on the primary ABC. It was only positive on irritability. Um, there's another study conducted in Iran, which found exactly the same. Negative on total ABC, but positive on ABC irritability. And we have just finished, but not yet published, a much bigger study, we think much better designed, of NAC in autism. So our sample size was 104 kids, and it was completely negative on every endpoint. We had hundreds of measures, and it did absolutely nothing. Uh, so I don't know what you can read into it. Um, I think autism is, about, is a very heterogeneous disorder. And what you call autism may differ hugely, and how you diagnose it may differ hugely. 
We also used a much lower dose than the other guys did. So we used 500 milligrams because our, our age started at about five. Um, they, they, they looked at older kids and used bigger dose. We were very careful and cautious, probably too cautious. So I think the jury's still out on autism, but our study was completely negative. We saw nothing at all. Yeah. No. There aren't that I'm aware of, although I did have a conversation a couple of years ago with a guy called Jim Locke from Stanford about doing a study, but as far as I know, I don't think they've made any progress on it. But here's an interesting one, obsessive compulsive disorder. So this is a, a study uh, which suggests that MAC might be useful for obsessive compulsive disorder. To date, th this is the only published study, um, but there is a study that is currently underway being led by Jerome Saris at the Melbourne Clinic. Uh, and that study is nearing completion, at least the pilot. It's also going to be a relatively small study, about 40 people. And so we're very keen to see what they find. But there are very few treatments for OCD. And anything that helps uh, would be very useful. One of the things about OCD, I mean, this is just an aside. Just look at the placebo group. Absolutely nothing happens to OCD. It's the most placebo non-responsive condition we have in psychiatry. Uh, anything that gets OCD rate, uh, better is real. It has the lowest placebo response rate of any condition in psychiatry. So we're very interested to see what Jerome finds. This is a study um, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And I put this in for Dr. Les Kupovitz. Um, so this is a study that was done in Iraq in an American military combat personnel. So I mentioned to you that N-acetylcysteine reduces inflammation, it reduces oxidative stress, it, it reduces apoptosis, and therefore it's a very promising agent to give to people who've had an immediate head injury or head trauma. And that's exactly what they did. So they took American combat personnel who were hit by improvised explosive devices. So a bomb went off, the, 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 med, the medics hit them, and the first thing they, did, they tried to do is they gave them NAC. So they used a 4-gram dose. So this is the study that you, uh, you asked about, the 4-gram dose, or placebo, but it's only seven days. Um, and they looked at a composite outcome measure of hearing loss, headache, memory loss, PTSD-type symptoms. And let me just talk you through the figure. So the left-hand side of the figure is NAC in the first 24 hours. And the right-hand side of the figure is NAC given after the first 24 hours. So just concentrate on the left-hand side figure, NAC in the first 24 hours. The bottom figure is early with NAC. And the top figure is early without NAC. And just focus your eye on the blue. So the blue is no sequelae. You, you walked out of this unscathed. And you can see that 86% of people who got NAC within the first 24 hours had no sequelae versus 42% who got placebo. This is a really big finding. This is really big. Um, and this opens the door to the use of NAC in car injuries. What about footballers? What about you know, AFL concussions? What about, what about, what about? So I think that this is a very interesting, very important study. Um, motor vehicle accidents. I mean, this opens a whole new door to a variety of forms of trauma. Again, your mother's advice you have to bear in mind. This is a first study. It hasn't been replicated. At the moment, we can only say it, you know, the next time you have an Iraq combat veteran who's been blown up by a bomb and you've seen them in the first 24 hours, Maybe you've got something to do, but for the rest of us who don't see those patients, it's just an interesting finding.